Okay, thank you very much. I wish I, wish I could uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here, but I'm one of the organizers, so it feels a little uh, shady. But anyway, so I'm gonna tell you uh, two very short stories, very simple stories uh, that I've been doing recently, and some of the work is uh, with uh, Amartya, who's sitting right here, and some other is with him, and uh, Sumati, Sumati's student, and Yuval Geffen. All right, so first, uh, acknowledgments, thanks to various people, and uh, that's enough said about that. Okay, so here's an outline. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about IQHE Ages. I know we have not spoken about it yet in the pedagogical talks, and uh, tomorrow, actually, Yuval Geffen is gonna present a tutorial or a pedagogical talk on the integer quantum hall edges, or maybe even not just integer, but general edges. And I'll say a little bit about reconstructions. And then I'll talk about the cases of nucleus one and two, which are really the, the simplest possible cases. And then it turns out that the conclusions that were reached in the very first analysis of these cases were not quite right. And so we'll talk about revisiting those issues, and then um, I'll continue. So the New equals two is the first topic, which is right here. And then there is another edge that I want to talk about, which goes from a bulk of new equals four to a bulk of new equals three. And uh, as usual, please uh, interrupt me at any time uh, with questions if you don't understand something I'm saying. All right. So uh, in the morning, I told you about how the bulk Landau levels are completely degenerate. Now imagine adding a smooth potential to the edge of the system, and by smooth, I mean something that varies very slowly on the scale of the magnetic length L. That's what I mean by smooth. In that case, what usually happens is that the Landau levels kind of smoothly follow the background potential. And so as you can see, this is the n equals zero Landau level, its energy is one half h power omega c, this is the first one, it's three halves, and so on, and they basically just follow the potential as it rises, and at some point, they cross the chemical potential. All right, so in the bulk, you can see that from the lowest, from the highest occupied state to the chemical potential, there's a gap, and this is usually true of all charged excitations, so there's a charge gap in the bulk. However, at the edge, they cross the chemical potential, so you can imagine making particle hole excitations, or you can even imagine adding charge, basically at very low energies. So all the low energy transport occurs at the edge. All right, so in this case, this is basically two Landau levels full, and you'll have two edges over here that are propagating in one direction, okay? Again, if you don't know, let me just explain why that is. So you can think of this as a spectrum as a function of x, but you can also think of it as a spectrum as a function of ky, okay? Because you know that these, all these guiding centers, their location in x is actually proportional to the momentum in the y direction. And so therefore, you can think of this as an E versus K, and the group velocity of this is D by DK, and in this case, it's just in one direction. So these are chiral modes, and that's typical of the integer quantum Hall effect. Okay, so here's a bulk, it's charge gapped, vacuum, of course, completely gapped, and here are the two chirals, two charge modes that are low energy modes. Okay, so here's basically in words, everything that I said, all the transport that you measure in quantum Hall systems will occur near the edge, near at, at low temperatures. Now, I've shown you a case of integer quantum Hall effect previously, which was just basically two charge modes, but other things can happen as well. So what are these other things? I think Mithali already mentioned, and David also mentioned, that there are a couple of constraints on the structure of the edge. Okay, one of them is that the total Hall conductance, no matter what happens to the edge, the total Hall conductance must reflect what is happening in the bulk. And the second constraint is that the total thermal Hall conductance should also be quantized, and it should also be a, a function of the bulk properties. That's a little more complicated, okay? So modulo these two constraints, many, many, many things can happen. Okay, so what are some of the things that can happen? All right, so here's a case of nu equals four. Okay, so I have kind of staggered the occupations of the various different modes that would be occupied in nu equals four. So there's zero up, there's zero down, one up and one down. And if you had a sharp edge, so this now is not the potential anymore, it's the background charge density. Okay, so imagine you had a sharp edge where the background ended abruptly. Then 
all these guys, the occupations of all these different land levels will presumably end very close to each other at the same point. Okay, that's called a sharp edge. As you made this potential, this background, sorry, this background charge density smoother and smoother, what the electrons want to do is they want to neutralize the background charge density, and so they basically spread themselves out. Okay, so here it is. Here's an example of what might happen. So the n equals one up, one down ends here, the one up ends here, zero down ends here, and zero up ends there. So basically, you've spread out the charge density along the, the width of this edge so as to better neutralize the background charge density. All right, so as I said before, the primary driver of these edge reconstructions is the electrostatic interaction between the electrons themselves and between the electrons and the background. Now, as it happens, the electrons also want to have, want to be in a gapped state. So they want to be, in this integer case, in the integer quantum Hall states. So that's the competition. Okay, they want to neutralize the background. Of course, the best way to really do it is to have a smooth charge density that's exactly equal and opposite to the background charge density. But that would violate this condition, that they want to be in an integer quantum Hall state. And uh, so that there's a competition there. All right, now that is the primary driver of edge reconstructions. But there are other things that can happen as well. And there are certain kinds of transitions, edge reconstruction transitions that can happen because of spin exchange, not primarily because of electrostatics, but primarily because of spin exchange. And of course, once you get to the FQHE, things become really wild, especially the case of two-thirds that I was asking Jirendra about in the morning. So this case has still not been solved in the sense that there's no really good explanation of experiments yet. Okay, so here is a very simple example of a reconstruction. So let's take nu equals one. So as I said, if you had a sharp edge where the background, potential, background charge density was varying sharply towards the edge, then it would form what is called a compact edge. So the occupation would be one until some point and then zero thereafter. Everything I'm saying is basically a Hartree-Fox statement, okay? Because in reality, of course, with interactions, these occupations are not conserved. Okay, the interactions can actually take a particle and create, take two particles and create two particle hole pairs. Okay, they could do that. And that will smear out this occupation function a little bit. So let's think in terms of our Hartree-Fock effective one body picture, and then all these things are true. All right, now what Shamon and Wren found in 94 is that as you make this background charge density smoother and smoother, there comes a point where W, W is the, is the distance in units of the magnetic length over which this background density goes to zero, okay? So everything is dimensionless. And <clears throat> what they found was that at around W equals 11, between 10 and 11, what happens is that a lump of occupation splits off of the main, uh, main bulk, and it goes over some distance, okay? Why does this happen? Again, because of electrostatics. There's a charge density that results from this particular lumpy configuration is actually better able to screen this this smoothly varying background charge density than the compact edge. Okay, that's the reason this happens, all right? And in this configuration, if you now plot the one body Hartree-Fock energy levels, before reconstruction, it just smoothly rose up and became a constant, and then it crossed the edge only at a single point. But now what happens is that the, the energy actually rises up and comes down again and then rises up again. So at this point where it's below the chemical potential, there is of course a lump of occupation. So this width is supposed to correspond to that width over there, okay? Whenever something is occupied, of course it has to be below the chemical potential, right? Okay, so now you look at this thing and then you say, oh, now if you think of this as an E versus K, there are actually three different edges here. There are two of them that are moving in the same direction, okay, this guy and this outermost guy, and they are called downstream modes. Okay, they are moving in the direction in which charges usually move in the quantum Hall effect. And there's another guy who's E versus K, DE by DK is negative over here. Okay, and that's called an upstream mode. Okay, so this particular case has two downstream modes and one upstream mode. Okay, this is called the shaman len reconstruction. Okay, great. Question. Absolutely, you can set, definitely have fractional quantum Hall states, but you cannot access them by a Hartree Fock. So everything that I'm talking about will be in the Hartree Fock approximation. Okay, so of course there will be fractional. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
Well, so what I'm talking about here is not actually confinement by a potential. I'm thinking of a case when the background charge density, so imagine a disk, right? So the background charge density is, is exactly right to cancel the nu equals one in the bulk, and then the background charge density goes to zero. So the potential that arises due to this charge density is of course something which is quite smooth. It's not really very sharp at all, okay? But nonetheless, you can understand that the electrons want to neutralize the background charge, right? So they would prefer to do this, or in, in, in the case when the width W is big, they would prefer to do this, okay? So of course you can translate this thing to a potential, but uh, I'm, I'm choosing to work with the background charge density. Okay? Good. Now, it turns out a few years after someone and when did their work, Franco and Bray actually reanalyzed the situation. And what they did was they said, let's go back to the compact edge, which is this guy here, right? And let's look at the collective modes of this compact edge. And there's a particular technique that builds on top of Hartree-Fock. It's called time-dependent Hartree-Fock. And uh, what it does is it finds the collective excitations for a given Q. Okay, so you see what happens here is that translation symmetry is broken in the direction perpendicular to the edge, but it's still there in the direction along the edge. Okay, so that translation symmetry means that any excitation can be classified by a quantum number which tells you what the momentum is perpendicular to the, uh, along the edge. Okay, just like all your eigenstates in the morning had, were labeled by quantum numbers, the momentum along the edge direction, right? Similarly here, all excitations can be labeled by such a momentum. Now they calculated the, the excitations, and here's what they found. So they said, here's the charge excitation, and here's the spin excitation, okay? The charge excitation looks very normal for a sharp edge. As you increase the width of this edge background density, you see that around W equals seven, this thing dips below zero, okay? And that means that there's some kind of instability of this state, okay? Similarly, if you look here, this is the spin wave excitation, and uh, everything looks good for W equals zero, and as you go to W equals 6.7, it dips below zero, okay? So this is evidence that even before the shaman when reconstruction happens, something else happens, some other kind of reconstruction happens, and looking at this, it appears as though whatever reconstruction happens should be breaking the translation symmetry along the edge direction. Okay? Yeah. Sorry? Say that again? Yeah. Vanishes to zero. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. So as W increases to between somewhere between six and seven, both of these, the charge density excitation and the spin wave excitation, both go below zero. Okay, so there's some instability of the, the, the compact edge. All right, so the natural thing to do after that, yeah, question. Yes, along the edge direction. Okay, so remember the, the compact edge has translation invariance along the edge direction. Okay, so that, that's this momentum. And there is no other momentum, right? Because that's the only direction in which you have translation invariance. All right, so what they did was they said, okay, we know the translation symmetry is going to be broken, so let's look for some translation symmetry broken ground states. Okay, this is a hard calculation, but they did it. And here's what they found. Here's their phase diagram. So um, this, so these notations, I'll tell you what they are. This is the spin polarized compact edge, okay? So this is the normal, normal edge that we were talking about, okay? Now if you increase W at very tiny values of the Zeeman energy, you go into a phase which, is, which they call a spin textured edge, okay? So what's happening is that as you come close to the edge, the spins are kind of, so imagine that direction is the edge direction. The spins are all polarized in the bulk, and as you come close to the edge, they're bending down like this, okay? So there's some region over which they bend down like that, and then, not only do they bend down, they also rotate as you go along the edge direction, okay? So they, they, they form a spin texture as you go along the edge direction. And that really is what creates the charge that screens the, the, the background charge, okay? So that's the spin texture edge, all right? If you go to larger values of the Zeeman, then of course the spin texture, everything wants to get polarized. So indeed, what they find is that there is a spin polarized charge density wave state. Okay, where the charge actually kind of goes back and forth along the edge, 
Okay, so there's, it pushes out tons of charge. Okay? And so on average, if you go along the edge, it's better able to screen the background. SPC is spin polarized compact edge. It's, it's the usual edge that, that, that we know for near equals one. Okay? So that's what they found. All right. Very good. So at the top, they didn't explore too much, but they actually find something that has a coexistence of this guy and that guy. So they have both spin texture and you know, charge density. So the, the idea is that in this case, the charge is actually uniform along the edge direction. So the charge doesn't break translation along the edge direction, the spin does, okay? In this case, of course, the spin is constant and the charge breaks it. Here, both of them break it, okay? Good, yeah. No, this was nu equals one, and as soon as you add interactions, it's automatically polarized by sort of a Hund's rule argument, okay? Even though they're degenerate, the Coulomb energy is reduced when all of them are the same spin. So it was spin polarized to begin with, even without the Zeeman energy. The spin texture, as I said, as you go towards the edge, imagine the edges over there, the spin was up in the bulk, it bends down as you go towards the edge. Not all the way, but it bends down like this. And then if you go along the edge direction, it winds around. So the Z component goes down, okay? And then it winds around the, the, the sphere. And that particular configuration actually has a charge. Okay, in a quantum Hall system, if you make a spin texture, it actually has a charge. Okay, and that's the charge that, that helps to neutralize the, the background charge. Okay, it makes the charge smoother. All right, so let's now think about nu equals two. Okay, so nu equals two, the, the first work was by Dempsey, Gelfand, and Halperin. Okay, so what they did, was again, so this was like my cartoon earlier, but this was an actual calculation. So what they did was they said, okay, if you take a, a sharp edge, then both the up and the down will be compact and they will be ending at the, the occupations will be ending at the same point, okay? Now, as you make this guy smoother, at some point the down will retreat and the up will expand and there'll be a small region of spin polarization created near the edge, okay? So this was the, Dempsey, Gelfand, Halper in reconstruction, and this happens at some critical value of the width, okay? Good, so this is all completely correct. So what Amartya did is he did exactly the same thing that, that, that Franco and Bray did for the case of nucleus one. So he took the time-dependent Hartree-Fock and he computed the charge density and the spin density excitations off the compact edge, the Dempsey, Gelfand, Halper in edge, and remember, it has actually two edges. It has a down edge and it has an up edge. Okay, good. He calculated that. And then eventually, when you increase this W to a large enough value, which is somewhere around 16, then this, the, the, the charge density and the spin density actually again go below zero, just as it did for nu equals one. And then you look for symmetry broken ground states with breaking translation symmetry along the edge direction. So, and you found exactly the same two kinds of states that they found, a spin textured kind of state, where the spin breaks the translation symmetry but the charge doesn't, and the charge density wave kind of state where the, the charge density basically just breaks translation symmetry. All right, let me show you some pictures. Now, I don't know if you can see the yellow here. Can you see the yellow? No. Okay, you can see the, the magenta, right? Okay, so just trust me that there's something below that, okay? <laughs> so W equals 15 is the magenta and this yellow line goes somewhere below here. And uh, so somewhere between W equals 15 and 16, the charge density excitation goes below zero, okay? So that is the charge density. The spin density is even more dicey. So it starts out actually something like this, which looks reasonable, okay? And then as you increase the W, it becomes extremely flat. Okay, so here at least you can see the W equals 15 that is just about to touch the zero and then W equals 16 goes below. Okay, so again, somewhere between W equals 15 and 16, this seems to become unstable. There's something that would break translation symmetry along the edge direction, okay? So you do exactly the same thing that Franco and Bray did and you look for Hartree-Fock ground states that break the translation symmetry along the edge. 
Ja. Okay, so the edge reconstruction of Dempsey, Gelfand, and Halpern occurs at about between somewhere between two and three, W of between two and three. So the two edges stick together, the up and the down, and around two or three, it splits apart like this. And that's actually second order phase transition. They split apart continuously. And as W increases, the separation between them also increases. Uh, we never actually found that. Yeah, we never found that. I think he looked, Amartya looked all the way up to W equals 22, and we never found it breaking off. But you would imagine that at some point when the, when the, the new equals one region becomes more than, you know, has, has some sloping background density which has more than W equals 11, you would expect to see it. That, that probably happens at a very, very large W. We haven't seen it. Okay. So uh, here's the phase diagram. So this is still tentative. There's some rough edges over here, so to speak. Um, so here's the phase with the spin texture, where the spin breaks the transmission symmetry, but the charge doesn't. And here's the phase, oops. Here's the phase where the charge breaks the transmission symmetry, but the spin doesn't, okay? I'll show you some pictures. So here's the SX. So this is to show you that something is actually bending down. There's actually some X component, okay, of the spin. And you can see that it has some periodic structure along the edge. So this is the edge direction, and that direction is the direction perpendicular to the edge. Okay, so this is some periodic variation in the SX as you go along the edge, okay? So that's the spin textured edge. And somewhere here is the charge density for W equals 17. And, and, and this EZ, and you can see that this charge density actually has no translation breaking along the edge. Okay, so this is to show you that this, it's only the spin that breaks translation symmetry along the edge. Okay? All right. Then similar pictures for some other values and uh, so on and so forth. So, what's the point of all this? So, what I have told you is that we have a symmetry broken ground state in one dimension. Of course, we know this is not possible because the symmetry I'm breaking is a continuous symmetry. It's a translation symmetry, and so we can't really break that. Okay, so it's an artifact of Hartree-Fock that, that we seem to have broken it. So what will really happen is that this so-called crystal, so you think of this one-dimensional crystal, it'll have fluctuations, and at long distances, the fluctuations will melt the crystal, the quantum fluctuations will melt the crystal. And so what you'll be left with is actually some neutral modes, which are basically like the phonons of this would-be crystal, okay? So that's what is left. And so what happens at the end of this is you generate an extra pair of neutral modes which are counter-propagating to each other. Okay, so that's what happens. The two charged chiral modes, of course, still have to remain because something has to, has to preserve the Hall conductance. Okay, so those two modes have to be there, okay? Good, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about a different kind of edge. Okay, so this was a real edge between nu equals two and the vacuum. Now I'm gonna talk about a different kind of edge, which is between nu equals four and nu equals three. Okay, so here's this story. And uh, so this was work done with uh, Sumati and Sumati student Suman and Amartya and Yuval Geffen. So let's start with the bulk of nu equals three and nu equals four. There's something slightly interesting that happens. So, nu equals three, for very low Zeeman and for very low interactions, it has this particular ground state, right? You want to basically fill up the lowest energy states. That's what you want to do when you're non-interacting. Okay, so you fill them up and you get this configuration. Now, let's imagine that you make the Zeeman energy even zero, but you start jacking up the interaction strength. So what do I mean by the interaction strength? Everything is dimensionless, so I want the ratio of a typical interaction energy to the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is just the cyclotron energy, and the interaction energy is this, where L, again, is the magnetic length. So as I jack up the interaction energy, it turns out that at a particular point, in this case, for Coulomb interactions, it's about 2.5, the system, this nu equals three bulk, undergoes a first order phase transition from this partially polarized state to a fully polarized state, okay? Driven by interactions, not by Zeeman. 
All right. Do the same thing for nu equals 4, right? So it starts with a singlet state, unpolarized, and it goes directly to a fully polarized state. Okay. A little surprising, but for the Coulomb interaction and for any screened, reasonable screened Coulomb interaction, it turns out that the partially polarized state that would have resulted from taking this downspin and putting it up here, it actually is higher in energy than either of these two. Okay, so it undergoes a direct transition from unpolarized to fully polarized. And that happens at 2.93. Okay, so you notice, of course, that this guy is bigger than that guy. So you come up with some scenario. So here's the scenario. Let's say that you have your correlation energy, which lies in between these two critical values. Okay, so it is bigger than the critical value for nu equals 3. So the nu equals 3 bulk will be fully polarized. It's smaller than the critical value for nu equals 4. So nu equals 4 will be unpolarized. Okay? Then you say, okay, I'm going to engineer a system where it is nu equals 4 bulk on the left-hand side and nu equals 3 bulk on the right-hand side and ask myself what happens in between as I change this with W, again, of course, in units of the magnetic length. Okay, so what do you expect? Well, one obvious thing to happen is this. Okay, so what has to happen is the downspin states have to leave, have to exit the, from below the Fermi energy, and the two up state has to enter the Fermi energy, okay? Has to come below the Fermi energy, and so this is what you expect. So again, you expect two downstream modes and one upstream mode, okay? And indeed, this is, we, we do see this, okay, in, in, in some regimes of parameters. But here's another state that we see, which is a little bit surprising. Okay, so here, what happens is that only a single state exists the Fermi energy, okay? However, in the course of whatever is going on here, you see that this state has remained unchanged, but this zero down, as an energy level in hartree fock it always remains below that guy, okay? But its character changes from zero up to one up, sorry, zero down to one up as you go across the interface, okay? Similarly, this guy here, it changes character from one up to two up. And only a single energy level exists the Fermi surface. I, didn't, I shouldn't say Fermi surface, exists, goes above the chemical potential. Okay? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, very good question. So the question is, do, does, do things that are happening far below the Fermi energy have anything physical, have any physical significance? Yes, the answer is yes. And the reason is the following. So here, the naive expectation is that there's actually only a single chiral mode, right? But now you look at all this stuff here, and once again, what Hartree-Fock has done for you is it has broken a U1 symmetry. In this case, the U1 symmetry is the symmetry of rotations around the, the z-axis. Okay, imagine you had some tiny Zeeman. So the SU2 of spin rotations was broken down to a U1. Okay, so you have a, a, a U1 symmetry, and you've spontaneously broken it. Okay, that's what this is showing, because some of the spins are lying in the xy plane. Okay, so of course that can't happen, right? Because it's a continuous symmetry, you can't break it. Nonetheless, what happens is that whatever's in here, it behaves like a xxz model, which has, at least in terms of symmetries, right? It has the same xy symmetry. And so there is going to be a pair of gapless modes, and in this case, we believe they're going to be spin waves. So yes, it does have some physical significance because it leads to extra gapless modes. Okay, so again, same deal. So, okay, I could have just shown you this slide instead of saying all that stuff, <laughs> but all right. So um, basically, uh, there will be a pair of, there will be an extra pair of counterpropagating neutral modes. So even though these levels appear to be way below the chemical potential, they produce gapless modes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I deliberately <laughs> did not draw everything. You see, I've changed the color here, right? So the color means that this doesn't remain down. So remember on this side, the blue is always up and the red is always down. So these are all kinds of different colors, right? Yeah. So that means that there's something complicated happening to the spin. All of them are changing character, both in terms of Landau level 
character and in terms of spin character. So they're all undergoing various kinds of spin rotations. So it's some very, very complicated thing. So here's the phase diagram. Again, it's got some, some not quite final aspect to it because we're still working on this. And so there is a strange kind of re-entrance. So for very tiny values of W, for a very sharp edge, we find that there are actually three charged chirals, okay, the, the naive picture that you would expect. And also for very large values of W. This is easy to understand because you see if you had three different chirals, you could kind of spread them out to take into account a, a, a background that varies over a longer distance. In the middle, you find the single chiral. That's also understandable. The question is why is there this phase here at a very small value of the W? We have some speculations. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the idea. The idea is that somehow, in order to do this, you have to pay some spin stiffness energy because you have to spin rotate lots of different levels. So you have to pay a stiffness energy, and this one you don't. So it's that competition between the stiffness and the fact that you're not quite neutralizing the, the, the electrostatic background as efficiently as you would here. OK. So here are some pictures. This is a. Uh, a case when you had three different chirals. So this is an actual Hartree-Fock calculation. Okay, so again, two downstream chirals, one upstream chiral, and all kinds of level crossings. And this is in spin-restricted Hartree-Fock, okay? Or sorry, this is the spin-restricted solution to an unrestricted Hartree-Fock. And you can see the total SZ just goes up in steps, okay? It, it basically, one of the downspins leaves the Fermi energy, another upspin enters, and a third downspin leaves, okay? If you plot the same thing, for a case when you had this single chiral crossing the Fermi energy, it would look something more like this. Because of course in Hartree-Fock, SZ is not a conserved number, right? And so you can get all kinds of values. That's what it looks like. All right. So, uh, uh -huh. and this is to show you that actually the spins are lying in the plane. In Hartree-Fock, they're lying in the XZ plane, so you can see the SX, the total SX is non-zero. All right, so I'm going to end. So basically, what I've shown you is that even integer quantum Hall systems can have some interesting reconstructions. And if you do a Hartree Fock on them, which you can on integer systems, they appear to break some U1 symmetries. Of course, you can't really break a U1 symmetry. So what happens is that because it's U1, it's sort of XY like. And even though the symmetry is not broken, it leaves behind some gapless modes. Okay, so this is, seems to be a way of generating what would appear to be unnecessary gapless modes, okay, things that are not dictated by the, the, the topological properties of the bulk. Okay, and when you have more and more of these neutral modes, they can actually do all kinds of things. They can carry, of course, heat, and they can also dephase you if they're slow enough, if, they're, if their velocity is low enough. Okay, so they can do all kinds of things. And also, when you have disorder along the edge, you can expect that this disorder will actually nucleate small regions of this kind of phases and you could get lots of low energy modes as a result of this. And uh, maybe it has some experimental implications. That's pretty much what I want to say. <laughs>